I would not call myself an expert in the face of this <laughs> individuals in this room. But thank you. It's a great privilege to be here today and to hear what Professor Kleinrock, Jimmy Wales, and Secretary General Toure had to say about this rich history and current state of the internet. Um, I have to say this is much harder than my usual speeches. Imagine talking about the internet to a room full of people that invented it, have given us marvelous applications, and continue to work so tirelessly to actually bring the internet and all of its benefit and values to every citizen on the earth. I also want to recognize and thank all those who are taking the time to join us via webcast and through the 13 hubs organized through the Internet Society chapters around the world and across virtually every time zone. So thank you all for spending this time with us. At the Internet Society, we're very excited to be celebrating 20 years as a mission-based organization. Our mission, of course, is to support the open development, evolution, and use of the Internet for the benefit of every person on the face of this earth. We owe our existence to a number of individuals and organizations who in 1992 had the vision to create the Internet Society to, and I'll quote, facilitate the technical evolution of the Internet, specifically to be the institutional home to the Internet Engineering Task Force, the IETF, to educate and advocate on behalf of the Internet, and to foster collaboration among organizations in their operation and use of the Internet. End quote. Special thanks go to Bob Kahn and Vint Cerf, both from CNRI and under whose auspices the Internet Society was created. And Vint, of course, served as the first president of the society. Thanks also go to Educom and Kenneth King and Rare, now Tarina, the Trans-European Research and Education Networking Association, for their support um, in the Internet's foundation, specifically at that time, Case Negers, and then ultimately Jürgen Harms, who was with SWITCH and with the Centre Universitaire d'Informatique de Genève. There are many others to thank, of course. Particular thanks go to Lyman Chapin, Larry Lanweber, Mike Roberts, served as ISOC's first executive director, and the remainder of the first board of trustees who will all be recognized later this evening. We also have to thank the Internet Activities Board, uh, reborn as the Internet Architecture Board some years later, as they all contributed so significantly to our very early beginnings. So the Internet Society has come a long way over the past two decades, and we owe much to our family of 130 organizational members, 50,000 individual members, and over 90 chapters around the world. Over the years, we've been proud to work with many members and many other organizations, and we certainly look forward to welcoming many more. So it's been an amazing 20 years of growth. And I'd like to take some time this morning, not much, to talk about how far the Internet has come in the past two decades and where the future challenges lie. So let's first talk about the Internet at the time the Internet Society was formed. Twenty years ago, the idea of a data network with a global reach was something that hadn't penetrated the consciousness of most people. Twenty years ago, the Internet certainly wasn't on the radar of the general business community. And twenty years ago, it wasn't something governments treated as central to their economic or social progress. In fact, many countries were not even connected. Finally, 20 years ago, who would have imagined that governance over the Internet would be such a polarizing debate? Yet the core values that would make the Internet's growth possible and that remain absolutely essential to its future were already visible. One clear example of this was the network training workshops, NTWs as they were known, which were started by Larry Landweber in the early 1990s, uh, sorry, which was started by uh, Larry Landweber and transitioned to the Internet Society in the early 1990s. These workshops, one of this community's most significant accomplishments, and which were supported by individuals, companies, and universities from across the world, played a critical and central role in helping most of the developing countries come on the Internet in the late 80s and 1990s. What enabled all this was a collaborative, community-based, open process with one goal, building a global, open Internet for all. All the participants cared about, and there were thousands of them over the years, including some of the people in this room, was bringing the Internet and its benefits to the world. And if you think about it, everything that is good and right about the Internet reflects this approach and is built and base in the multi-stakeholder process. 
The internet has always grown organically, responding to needs of individuals and the network itself. Its distributed, open, and building block structure <clears throat> has paved the way for years of amazing creativity and value. The freedom that individuals have to provide online services without the approval of a central authority or a governing body is critical to its utility and its value creation. At the Internet Society, we refer to this as permissionless innovation. But let's fast forward to today. We do our research on the web, plan get-togethers using mobile location services, keep in touch with friends on social networking sites, and start global businesses online. When we make international phone calls, many of us do so for a fraction of what it once cost, thanks to the Internet. Of course, the Internet has been used for even more dramatic purposes, by doctors to improve a medical outcome, by consumers to express opinions, by nation's citizens to rally support for a point of view or to protest political repression. One obvious recent example is the Arab Spring. Indeed, there is emerging consensus that the ability to use the internet to express views and communicate should be a fundamental human right. Five years ago, when the internet had roughly half the number of users it has now, the idea that the use of the internet was somehow a fundamental right would likely have been a fringe view. Today, I think most of us would say that people in every nation must be able to use the internet to inform and make their voices heard. Sadly, we still have a way to go to make this a reality. As a contributor to the world economy, the internet's impact is staggering. The Boston Consulting Group says the internet contributed $2.3 trillion to the world's biggest economies in 2010 an amount higher than the GDP of the United Kingdom. And if the internet were its own sovereign nation, it would now trail only the United States, China, Japan, Germany, and France in terms of economic clout. In addition, the internet is a much needed source of job creation. A report by the consulting firm McKinsey found that in France, in the last 15 years, the internet has created 1.2 million jobs versus the 500,000 it lost through disintermediation. That's 2.4 new jobs created for every job lost. And worldwide, again quoting directly from the study, the brunt of its economic contribution derives from established in industries that, in the shadow of the internet, have become more productive, have created more jobs, have increased standards of living, and have contributed more to real growth. Moreover, 75% of the value add created by the internet is in <clears throat> traditional industries. It's no surprise that we believe the internet is a good thing at the Internet Society, and that's why so many people across the world are concerned when we run into obstacles with the potential to impede progress. For example, the proposed U.S. legislation to protect copyright holders, known as the Stop Online Piracy Act and the Protect Intellectual Property Act, known as SOPA and PIPA, they both might have made sense from a purely theoretical perspective, but they would have had a negative impact on internet users' experience. And that's also true of ACTA, the anti-counterfeiting trade agreement, which was similar in intent and international in scope. And the challenges keep coming. Most immediately this year, there are a number of international proposals that threaten to jeopardize some of the core principles of the internet. These proposals could result in countries assessing higher fees for data traffic, resulting in higher costs for everyone, and raising the likelihood that some people would not use these services because they're more expensive. Clearly, this approach would not advance economic development and would harm those who can least afford it. The language of some of the other proposals would compromise privacy or impact citizens' rights or allow nations to restrict the free flow of content that passes over their networks. If this happens, the internet will become a series of checkpoints and would become balkanized. So we've talked about the early days and a little bit about the internet of today. I'd like to conclude with some of the challenges that lie ahead. We all must work to protect the internet as we know it today. As leaders here in this room and to all of those participating remotely, we have a responsibility to do everything possible to make sure that people everywhere reap the economic and social benefits of the network. One of our greatest challenges is getting all people connected specifically the four and a half billion people around the world who aren't currently on the internet. For many of them, internet access has been prohibitively expensive, 
if it has been available at all. While this is improving through smartphones and other technologies, there is still a long way to go. There's no telling what will happen if we actually empower the creativity of those four and a half billion people. And I think that point was made quite clearly earlier today by Jimmy and Leonard. We all need to redouble our efforts to get all countries, all people, online, on a par. And through our efforts, big and small, we can all make an impact. For example, the Internet Society recently completed a study quantifying the advantages developing countries get by establishing Internet exchange points. The study looked at how Nigeria and Kenya, two countries in sub-Saharan Africa <clears throat> that do a very good job with their own IXPs, had lowered their cost and increased their network speeds. Our hope is that when we share this study with other developing countries, it will convince them to make the same investments and adopt similar practices. This is an excellent example of how the efforts of a very small group of people, and compared to the seven billion people on the planet, can actually rise to have national and global impact. So the internet continues to inspire, amaze, and challenge us every day. But the job is not done in one of the ways that matters the most. I'm taking another quote from an internet history retrospective written by Vince Cerf, Bob Kahn, Leonard Kleinrock, and a number of other internet pioneers. Quote, if the internet stumbles, it will not be because we lack for technology, vision, or motivation. It will be because we cannot set a direction and march collectively into the future. This is even more true today than it was then. We have all worked hard to create a free, open, and accessible internet, one that is not walled, not censured, not fractured, and we have to keep on working. Given the challenges of today and those coming, we must be vigilant in defending the Internet's principles and continue to support the multi-stakeholder model and the institutions that have so clearly contributed to its growth to date. We all have a stake in preserving the Internet, preserving our Internet. This should be our global call to action. So thank you for listening. We have a great two days of programs and speakers covering many of the issues that are so foundational to ensuring an open global internet. And I hope we all have a fantastic conference. Thank you.